is Radical Launch International Ministries, and we are hosting a Radical Empowerment Conference. Oh, yeah. It's a radically different conference because it's a virtual conference. Huh? Yeah, and we love to empower people to have a voice and to, to share the messages that God's putting with their hearts. Yes, and I love the way God is the consistent theme throughout, as well as what he shares through people is consistent also. And, and it's not just the same familiar verses. Yeah. It's some pretty far removed verses that keep yeah. popping up. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, so who's our next speaker? Our next speaker is Becky Bagby. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Becky is amazing. So Becky was pivotally used by God to help launch me into a global awakening school called Global School of Supernatural Ministry. And I went to go visit the, the ministry at a conference and to check out what their school was about. And I was, um, I was already ready to go to Liberty University as a youth pastor. And um, I was signed up, ready to go in January. And God has her give me this prophetic drawing. And I didn't know anything about prophetic drawing or art. And she hands me this piece of paper with a simple drawing on it. And it was just a whirlwind of all these colors. And it had peace, love, hope, joy, and faith all the way at the bottom. <laughs> and on the back, it said, go deeper. And like, it wrecked my life because my prayer was, God, I need to know what school I need to go to. Because I was just walking out in the ministry and I had no idea how to do this. And there wasn't anybody really helping, yeah. you know. And a lot of people were saying, you need to go to seminary. And I had a learning disability. Yeah, mm, yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> And so God was showing me that by going, um, going to Global School of Supernatural Ministry, he would help me get healed. And in that, I was able to actually, I ended up getting completely healed of my learning disability. And he launched me into ministry. And I can read the Bible like no one's business now. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and it was thanks to Becky. Yeah. Well, she actually originally was a critical care nurse for over 14 years. Mm. And she attended the Global Awakening School of Supernatural Ministry from 2008 to 2010, and then entered into full-time missions work. She served as the speaker care coordinator for GSSM South Africa yes. for two year, over two years. And she was also a volunteer with the Mordecai Project, helping with their child sponsorship program and was also a volunteer with the Uganda Orphans Fund for almost three years, and then most recently was their on-site director, full-time in Uganda for almost two years. Wow. Um, her deep desires of her heart are to love Jesus, follow him, truth, mm -hmm. and transformation. And those are the deep desires of her heart. And she's she, she is amazing. Um, she's basically willing to serve wherever God calls her to be. Yeah. And she's just there for him and him alone. Yeah, and she, she came through a lot of tough stuff. And yeah, she's she stood amazing. strong. Yeah, and so catch what she has to say because yeah. it's a powerful message and I'm believing it would touch your heart. Hi, my name is Becky Bagby, and today I would like to share a little bit with you about 10 simple things that I learned in the wilderness. But first, a little bit of background. So a number of years ago, I'm not sure how many years ago now, but a number of years ago, I was taking a lot of time to read through the Old Testament, focusing a lot in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, all those. And um, it, was, it was good. At the same time, I was personally going through some very, very difficult things. And so during that time, I remember, looking back through my journals, I remember uh, feeling a lot of despair. And I, was, I just kept really moaning and griping and complaining. Like, oh God, what is this that's happening? Why am I going through this? And oh, woe is me. And oh Lord, when are you going to come and rescue me and get me out of this wilderness? I'm tired of being in the wilderness, God. I just want something good to happen, please. Anyway, so in the middle of all of that, I'm hearing the Lord speak to me and he says, um... Becky, 
what what wilderness is this that you're talking about? I said, well, God, you know the, the, the wilderness like the one that Israel was in after you brought them out of Egypt. I said, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm in that kind of wilderness. And he said, Becky, did you read my book? Yes, I thought I did. <laughs> and again, I hear the Lord speaking to me and he's saying, why don't you go back and read it again? And this time, as you're reading, listen, and I will be faithful to show you really what my wilderness looks like. And so, even though that was a pretty, like, that was a pretty sharp rebuke deep inside of my spirit, but at the same time, I was like, yes! Oh, God, I am so happy. So I went back to Exodus, and I started reading again, and this time, I, God was so faithful to speak to me, to show me so many things that I, every single time I had read through it before, I had missed all of these things. Or, you know, I had probably recognized them at points, but not really put them all together as, this is what God's wilderness looks like. So I just want to first encourage you because a God-led wilderness journey is filled with hope and filled with God's presence. So if you don't have this perspective, you might wind up missing a lot of what God wants to show you. So here's the first thing that God showed me, and that is, first of all, He speaks so because he's speaking and he's always speaking, we should have our ears on and we should be listening. Now, I probably don't have to go into a whole lot of detail about that. It's all throughout scripture. I think you can see many, many times when God is speaking. But let me also point out along with that, that God is always listening as well. God is hearing us. When you go to the end of Exodus chapter 2, you hear, you get to read that God says that he heard the groanings of Israel as they were being oppressed by Egypt. And so God's not just speaking, God's always, he's also listening to us. So if he can speak and listen, we should also listen as well as speak. So the second thing that God showed me is God's moving, so we should be watching for what he's doing. So here's the really cool story. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the, sto the story from Exodus chapter 17, where Joshua is fighting the Amalekites, and Moses is up on a hill, and when he raises his arms up, Israel is winning, and but when he gets really tired and his arms are starting to drop, then Israel starts to lose. Well, fortunately, Moses has along with him Aaron and also her. And these two recognize what's happening. They see that when Moses has his arms up, God's moving and Israel is winning. So they pick up on that and they say, instead, like, here's the really cool thing about that. Those two, they could have just said, Come on, Moses, you can do it. Keep your arms up. You can do all of this. Yes, yes, go, go, go. But Moses would have been alone. And that's not a really good place to be. So instead, Aaron and her, they get a rock so that uh, Moses is supported. And then they each get under one arm. And they make sure that Moses' arms stay up so that Israel will continue to win the battle. So it's important for us to see where God is moving and for us to join in what God's doing in order for the victory to come about. And I'm going to just give you a little secret that the victory nine times out of ten is more in here than it is out there. Um, well, maybe not more, but both can happen. You can have victories inside as well as victories outside. So the third thing that I want to show you is that God is with us. That's the third big thing that God pointed out to me. 
And we also see all of that throughout scripture all the time. With this uh, wilderness experience specifically, God was providing manna. He was providing water. He was sustaining his people. Um, God cares. He was providing for their needs. Um, not one of their shoes wore out, which is really kind of cool. I have to replace my shoes every so often. Um, but God made sure that for 40 years they didn't even have to replace a sandal. Um, but God saves us. So that's another big takeaway. Um, throughout that entire time in the wilderness, God was always with them. He never left them. So the fourth thing that I want to point out is that there is purposes in the wilderness. Now, a lot of times, especially if we get stuck in the, oh, woe is me, and what's happening? I, God, where are you? Where are you in all of this? Mm -mm. That's not God's wilderness. That's a deception from the enemy. There is purpose in the wilderness. It's not just aimless wandering. And that's really cool. Um, I actually, I took these, these 10 simple things I've learned about the, uh, learned in the wilderness and turned them into a teaching for a Sunday school class, but it took weeks. So I'm condensing this down into just a few minutes. So trust me, there's a whole lot more with each of these, but the wilderness is not just aimless wandering. There is purpose in it. For instance, in Exodus chapter 20, we see that the Ten Commandments are revealed. Now, one of the really cool things um, that's uh, one of the purposes of the wilderness is twofold. The first thing is God is going, going to reveal who he is. And he's going to reveal who he's not. So pay attention to those two things as you're reading. And the next thing is that he's also going to reveal who we are, who we were created to be from the foundation of the world. All those amazing things that we were created to do way back in Genesis, back in the, the garden, he's going to reveal who we are. He's also going to reveal who we are not. So again, be paying attention to all of that. The fifth thing is there is promise. There's promise in the wilderness. One of the things that God shows is that he fulfills his promises all throughout. All throughout that wilderness experience where Israel, uh, after they left Egypt, God was constantly fulfilling his promises. Back in Genesis, back in the day when he was, God was speaking with Abraham, he said, your, your, your offspring are going to be enslaved by another nation, but don't worry, I will rescue them. And those people in the wilderness, that Israel in the wilderness, the fact that they were in there, was a fulfillment of God's promise to deliver them from an oppressor. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool thing to recognize. Number six, the wilderness gives us a really amazing opportunity to connect to our source. This is a place where we can really develop intimacy. Look at Moses all throughout that time. Moses was constantly spending time with God. Look at Joshua. Even after um, Moses left the tent of meeting, uh, I forget where that is, but anyway, even after Moses left the tent of meeting, Joshua would remain there, flat, prostrate, in front of the tent, continuing to seek God's face. That's beautiful, beautiful intimacy. Even in Exodus 19, God reveals a good plan. And that was his original plan for Israel as they came out of Egypt. Would that we would all be a kingdom of priests. Read through Exodus 19 and you'll see that um, God wanted all of us originally to be priests. Not just the priests to be priests and everybody else to be everybody else. He wanted all of us to be priests. Um... And then also one of the really cool things, I think it's also in Exodus 33, Moses 
is imploring God. He says, God, show me your ways. And I think that's beautiful. Just beautiful. Number seven, being in the wilderness is an opportunity for not just increase, because we physically saw that with Israel. They increased from however many came out of Egypt to oodles and oodles more by the time they reached the promised land. But also it was an opportunity for them to mature. We see lots of instances of maturing all throughout. Even from the earliest time when they came out of Egypt and uh, Jethro, I forget his other name, but Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was teaching Moses, surround yourself, you know, train up some of these other folks to be uh, listening to the voices of the people with you because you can't do all of that. So how many of those people who had originally been slaves of, uh, in Egypt had envisioned themselves as leaders of their people. I don't know. I would imagine at some point probably none of them had envisioned themselves to be leaders. But yet God was raising them up, giving them an opportunity where they could grow and mature as leaders and seek intimacy with the Lord, which I think is amazing and beautiful. So during that time, it was not just a time to develop intimacy, but it was also a time for Israel to develop Shema. Oh, I love the word Shema. It means to hear or to listen, but most every single time, um, actually, let me say that in a different way, Shema is also translated as obey. So every single time you see the word obey in the Old Testament, it's going to be Shema which means to hear and let what you do flow from what you have heard. That is the essence of obedience. Anyway, that was a bit of an aside. Um, so uh, along with increase in maturity, they were learning about their identity, who they were and who they weren't, like I mentioned earlier. They were learning about leadership and discipleship, and of course, they were increasing. Uh, number eight is worship. Um, that word that's, that's um, used for worship in the Old Testament, again, I, I apologize, I don't know how to define or how to pronounce this, but it's shaka. And it means to bow down. And uh, I mentioned in Exodus 19 how we were all originally supposed to be uh, priests, but the people at that point in time, the people in general didn't want to hear God's voice directly. They left that to Moses, and that's kind of a sad moment. But Jesus also defines um, worship. When you obviously go to the New Testament, Jesus defines worship as being spirit, uh, being in spirit and in truth. So um, Jesus gives us a great definition of worship when he says that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This is found in John chapter 4. The Hebrew word that is translated as shaka, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, I don't know, essentially means to bow down. So worship, as Jesus defines it, um, means that we're to bow down on the inside as well as the outside. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that our spiritual worship is when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So this means that all of us, all of us, inside, outside, all of us, is bowing down to worship and love God all of the time. Number nine, this is so, so, so important. If you feel like you are in a, having a, a wilderness time, again, recognize that there's so much hope and that God's presence is all throughout the wilderness. But also recognize that you, me, I need to come to the end of myself. And that is... A big shift in perspective. I'm going to read just a couple of notes. Um, sometimes we, we, meaning me too, sometimes we get in the way of God. We cannot hold on to Him 
if we're holding on to ourselves, if we're holding on to beliefs that don't match his kingdom, wounds or grudges or offenses or anything else. So in order to move forward into the promised land, we need to come to the end of ourselves. I need to come to the end of myself. In Numbers 13, 12 spies go to the promised land and they all see the same thing. But only two people, Joshua and Caleb, were willing to let go of all the other stuff they saw, the big giants and all that kind of stuff. They were the only two who were willing to let go of everything else they saw and believe God. They remained true to believing God over the next 40 years. And Joshua wound up leading the Israel into the promised land itself. Jesus assures us through his teachings that when we come to the end of ourselves, we will also find all things new. And those new things include new life, new mind, new heart, new eyes, new ears. There's a lot more other stuff. I can give you scripture verses for that another time. But it's just amazing when you realize how much can happen when you come to the end of yourself. There won't be a wilderness anymore. No. Brothers and sisters, there will not be. So, um... There was a couple of other things that I wanted to share about that. The promised land is a picture of salvation. It takes a lot of trust and it takes belief to enter it. Stay in it and conquer the giants and thrive. Therefore, the old, unbelieving, rebellious generation would have to die. That's a picture of the old man. That's why we have to come to the end of ourselves. And then we will find that all things are new. All those things that I mentioned before. New life, new mind, new heart, new eyes, new ears, all of that. So why would I not believe? If I'm struggling, it's not because Jesus is still working on my salvation. His work is done. It's because I haven't yet come to the end of myself. And I'm still working on believing that he actually has done it all. And that it really is finished. There's hope in that though. I just want to reassure you, there's hope in that. Because Jesus has already done everything. He doesn't have to keep going back to the cross. He's already been there. So I can confidently believe because it really is finished. Jesus didn't lie. So that brings me to number 10, and that is that God's testing solidifies the work that he's done in us. This testing that's in the wilderness, are, am I willing to shift my perspective? Am I willing to believe that he speaks, that he moves, that he's with me, that there's purpose in all of this, that there's promise, that I can connect to him, that I can grow up and increase and mature, that I can worship him and come to the end of myself? Do I really believe that? Because if I do, then I get to prove that he's done all of that in me. And that's beautiful. That's exactly what happened with Joshua. All of that was proved because he was the new man that got to lead Israel into the wilderness or into the promised land, out of the wilderness and into the promised land. But let's look, let's fast forward just a little bit and go to uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where we see Jesus in the wilderness. And this is really, really super powerful. At least it was for me. And that is, there were, there were some things that the enemy was trying to tempt Jesus was with. But here's what I want you to hear about Jesus' time in the wilderness. Yes, 
it was somewhat, it was a, a bit symbolic and representative of Israel's time in the wilderness as well. But here's what I really want you to take away. The time that Jesus spent in the wilderness proved every single thing that God had done with him and put inside of him for that moment. I personally believe that the journey to the cross started right there, that our salvation was won because Jesus proved right then and there in the wilderness everything God had done in him already. So first, Satan goes after Jesus' flesh because he tries to tempt him with, here, I know you're hungry, have some bread, you know, turn this stone into bread and have something to eat. Jesus established, though, that even though his body might be hungry, his spirit was satisfied. He was nourished, and he was full. He was full of the Word of God. Jesus knew his identity, and that wasn't going to change. Jesus didn't want food. He wanted his Father. He wanted us. Next, Satan went after Jesus' identity. Satan wanted to prove, he wanted Jesus to prove himself as the Son of God. Jesus didn't have anything to prove. Jesus already knew who he was. In fact, Satan knew who Jesus was as well. But Satan wanted Jesus to prove it by doing something that Satan wanted him to do. But Satan said, no. Jesus proved that he really was and is the Son of God by doing what God wanted him to do. And that's powerful. Testing does not prove God. Our obedience and Shema to God's voice proves God. Satan, uh, oh, and having the angel save him if he was to throw himself down Jesus had a right to do that. He could have done that if he wanted to. It was written. He could have done that. But Jesus remained humble, and he refused his rights as the Son of God so that he could remain purposefully focused as the sacrificial lamb. He went into the wilderness with purpose, and he proved his purpose in the wilderness. Satan went after Jesus' worship and authority. But Jesus proved God by worshiping the Lord, and Jesus later defines worship as being in spirit and in truth. Jesus had already established himself as the Word, and now he proved God by establishing that he, as the Word, is going to worship the Creator and not the created. Because he tells Satan, I'm only going to worship Father. Jesus did not want all the kingdoms of the world. Satan tried to tempt him with that. But the authority that Satan, or Jesus didn't want any of that. Sorry, got lost in my own notes. Ha <laughs> ha. So Jesus didn't want any of the stuff that Satan wanted to give to him. Jesus didn't want all the kingdoms of the world. He wanted the cross and he wanted us. So, we also have those same opportunities. Any time we feel like we are being tested, or any time that we feel like Satan has come to tempt us, guess what, brothers and sisters? We have an opportunity, even if we're feeling like we're being beaten down, we have an opportunity, an amazing opportunity, to prove the work of God inside of us. We have that opportunity to be able to prove that God is in us, He's transformed us, and we are new creations. So, brothers and sisters, there's lots of hope. God's presence is all in the wilderness, and the culmination of all of that is that we are transformed into our original image and we have the rest of our lives to have the opportunity and the immense privilege to prove God every day. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. Bye.